Uh, well, let's uh, open up to uh, the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9, and we're going to read a big section here from verses 10 through 31. Uh, Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 31. This is the second part of our uh, sermon uh, that was from last week. Continuing it, and we're going to read from verses 10 through 31 to give us a, a larger context for this. This is the 32nd sermon uh, titled Astonishing Reconciliation. Astonishing Reconciliation. Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 31, this is the public hearing of God's holy word. Now, there was a disciple of Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. Now here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Amen. This ends the reading of God's holy word. Well, as I said today, we're dealing with part two, part two of what we began last week. Saul of Tarsus, who is also known as the Apostle Paul, he undergoes a dramatic conversion to Christianity. Now, remember, Saul was the Jew who relentlessly was persecuting Christianity, the early Christians. And last week, we saw how Saul responded with his conversion to Christianity. Saul did three things. And the first thing he did was he prayed, but we also see that he was baptized. And then lastly, a third, the third thing was that he lived out that baptism by fellowshipping with the Christians. He prayed, again, not self-reliantly as he did before, but for the very first time, praying in the name of Jesus Christ. Second, again, he is baptized, receiving the sign and seal uh, of what it means to be a follower in Christ to be a part of the community of Christ. And third, he lives out his life of being baptized, and he actually spends time with Christians, both in Damascus and then in Jerusalem. Paul, from the get-go, immediately upon his conversion, shows that it is vital, it's vital to belong and participate in the community of Christians. In these three things, we see Paul's response to his conversion, and what really for all Christian conversion looks like, even for us. Now, what I want to do today 
is to look at how the church responds to Paul's conversion. Now that we saw Paul's response, we'll explore the church's response to Paul's conversion. How does the church receive him? And what are the implications of how we receive and respond to those who come to faith and join the church? Again, this week, we're going to break up the sermon into three points, three sections. And the first point is the realism of Paul's conversion story. Okay? It's real. It's accurate. It's, you see historical details. The realism of Paul's conversion. And the second point is we're going to look at specifically Ananias. And then the third point, we're going to see what Barnabas had to do. How Barnabas, uh, what it meant for Barnabas to, uh, to vouch for Paul. Again, the first point is realism of Paul's conversion story. Second is Ananias. And then third, it's regarding Barnabas. Okay. And so this is actually in your sermon uh, notes in your bulletin as well, so to help you with that. Now, first off, let's explore the realism of this story. Luke's report is, very, is a very realistic description of Paul's conversion. And when we understand this, we can have a deeper appreciation for the church's response to, a, uh, to any Christian conversion, and specifically what we see here with Paul. Again, this is in line with uh, a couple of weeks ago when we saw how Psalm 88, the realism of Christian depression. There's a realism in Scripture that we find here. And Luke, the author of this book of Acts, writes with Realism. Again, Luke, the author of the book of Acts, writes with this realism. Again, what does that mean, though? Let's, let's look at that a little bit more. Uh, remember, Luke is a doctor. right? He's a physician. He's also a historian. And so Luke writes as a physician and a historian might write. He writes the way uh, you might expect. He writes with uh, authenticity, factualness, details, and a measure of truthfulness, right? There's this truthfulness to it. He writes truthfully. He wrote in the beginning of Luke. Remember, Luke in Acts is volume 1, volume 2. And we find at the beginning of Luke, chapter 1, verse 3, how he followed all things closely for some past to write an orderly account. Right? In other words, he's not writing historical fiction. There's no sugarcoating the details. And so that's why often in the book of Luke, the disciples look very, very foolish. There's no shame in that. Or, or there is a lot of shame. But he writes that so that the people would read and see this is actually happening. He doesn't want to embellish with details that aren't true. Not only that, again, he's not exaggerating. He's not exaggerating to make his writings more sensational. Right? The emotions described are neither uh, fantasized or romanticized in any way. There's no hero worship, what we sometimes say, hagiographical writing. Right? Uh, that here's these holy people, and you're going to write uh, about them in a very, very uplifting kind of way. He's very truthful, very real, very authentic in the way he writes. And you have to understand why. Because if he embellishes it, if he creates it as a legend, the problem is people will see those details, and then what are they going to do? They're going to discredit the entire book. See, which is why Luke doesn't gloss over the details. Instead, he gives very specific details in terms of how the church reacts to Paul's conversion. This was the practice of ancient historians. Luke gave specific details factual details to be a kind of footnote. Footnotes are little notations that tell you where you can go to fact check. They tell you exactly where the author found the facts so that you can go check out the facts yourself. So as we read the passage, did you notice how there were details in the story? And this is done intentionally by Luke. This was how ancient history was documented so that you could be sure of the authenticity and the truth. Well, what do I mean? What are some of those specific detailed facts that we find that Luke deliberately includes? Well, 
Did you see how specific names of people are written? For instance, we're given the name Ananias. He's a real person. He's someone that you could actually go to and say, hey, is this what happened? This is what Luke wrote. It, did this happen or not? And if Ananias is either going to confirm it or he's going to deny it. But it's not just Ananias. You notice there's also at the house of Judas. He's another person, another name that you can fact check. We're also told about a street. A specific street name is recalled. And that street name is Straight Street. So you could actually go to Straight Street, confirm with Ananias, confirm with Judas, uh, the house of Judas, to see whether or not this all happened. In fact, that Straight Street, it's still today actually there. It's under a different name. Uh, it's called Derb El Mastakim. It's, it's a different name now, but it's the same street. Over history, over time, it's been recorded that that is where all of that took place. And so these details are given to verify and confirm the authenticity and veracity of Paul's conversion. Well, let me provide another uh, example of this here. One where Paul actually confirms the details with Luke in his own writings. And so Paul begins his preaching ministry all throughout Damascus. But notice how verse 23 begins. When many days had passed. What's the point of that? Well, this is a reference to Galatians chapter 117, where Paul tells us that he went away to Arabia for three years before he returned to Damascus and then goes to Jerusalem. And so Luke includes that there to help us remember, ah, yes, Paul began in Damascus, then goes to Arabia for three years, and then returns to Damascus, and then goes to Jerusalem for the first time as a Christian and as an apostle. There's still one more feature I want to point out to you regarding some historical accuracy. One where uh, Paul, again, he corroborates uh, the story uh, of what Luke writes here. And I want you to see in verse 25, details how he had to secretly escape. Right? He's lowered down in a basket and, uh, because the Jews wanted to kill him. Well, what do you think about this? Put yourself in Paul's shoes. This was an extremely humiliating experience. Let's not forget Saul of Tarsus. He was one of the foremost leading Jewish scholars at the time. He was a star on the rise, a very powerful, very well-known, very uh, uh, adored figure in the community with this kind of potential, this kind of uh, power. He then becomes someone whose life is now threatened. And you would think, what happened to this guy? What happened to this man? Paul actually references this historical event in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 32 and 33. And this is actually part of his apostolic defense. He wants the Corinthian church to know that his entire ministry, it began, in a sense, in this humiliating experience. He's called as an apostle, and he cites this, again, humiliating event as part of the beginning of his ministry as an apostle. And so I want you to see that there's a very realistic, very realism context that we see the church now respond to Paul, to the news of Saul's conversion to Christianity. So with our second point, we see how Ananias and how he specifically responds to Paul's conversion. And it's understandable, at least initially, how Luke portrays Ananias. He's skeptical, even suspicious. Luke doesn't try to sugarcoat Ananias' skeptical and doubting response to Paul's conversion. In Ananias, the believers in the church is not seen in the best light, actually. Here's how. Because after God commands Ananias to go to Judas' home, right, lay hands on Paul, how does Ananias initially react? In verse 13, what is, he, what is he saying? Are you nuts, Lord? 
Are you, are you insane? The same guy who came into uh, Damascus. This is the guy who in Jerusalem was binding people, uh, throwing them in jail. You know, he's the same guy who helped with uh, Saul or, or with Stephen's death. And now he actually has the backing of the chief priest to come into Damascus and to imprison us. Are you insane? You are asking me to put myself on a platter to this guy. All the Christians have gone into hiding, and now you want me to go to him? This is a death sentence. See, what I want you to recognize is there's pushback by Ananias. We're meant to feel that Ananias is not comfortable with what God wants from him. Can you imagine the dread and the terror that would have seized him after hearing God tell him, go to Paul, go to Saul. Again, Ananias is very aware of all the circumstances. The chief priests, they go into the, uh, how, how they're backing uh, Saul how widespread and common knowledge this had become. One person actually writes, Ananias showed weakness here. He did not have unwavering trust in God. As a matter of fact, he reminds me of me. I suspect that I would have said the same thing to God just in case he had somehow forgotten a little detail. After all, this Saul guy was dangerous. Didn't God know that? we can see that Luke doesn't gloss over, right? Luke doesn't gloss over Ananias' response of doubt and fear. If Luke were writing in a more compromising way, he might have tried to justify Ananias' response. Maybe omit it altogether. But this is not Luke's way. He writes what it seems, again, realistically and very frankly. Well, what happens once the Lord answers Ananias' objection? What does Ananias do? Verse 17, very matter-of-factly, Ananias departed and entered the house. Right, this is incredible. But we can also be humbled by this. Because at first, we come to God in fear. We come to God in doubt. And we saw that, especially with Psalm 88. And if you think about it in a larger context, what divinity in this world, right? What other religion that has some sort of God figure would actually listen to his people faltering in their faith and trust? What sort of God would still love and welcome us unconditionally in Christ Jesus? And so Ananias... Though he originally exclaimed fear and doubt and woe, he responds nonetheless with obedience. In obedience, Ananias, even with all that fear, goes to lay hands on Paul. Again, sometimes it can be really scary to obey God. Sometimes it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't always add up. And yet we see Ananias obey Is this what people mean by blind faith? Again, I say this, and I can't say it enough. I really despise that term. Because that is not what this is. Ananias is not blind. He sees very clearly that God is sovereign and in control. And that's why he responds in obedience. Blind faith would mean that even if you don't know if God is in control, whether he is or isn't, You just leap and wish for the best. But this is not what Ananias is doing. His response is firmly planted on the conviction that God is still in control. So what what does Ananias do once he gets to Paul? Imagine there he sees Paul. Still blind, weakened from having prayed for three days with no food. That was verse 9. He's emaciated. He's hungry. He's completely exposed, completely, incredibly vulnerable. Let me ask you, what would you do if you saw Paul there? Well, here's what Ananias didn't do. He doesn't begin by physically attacking the man. Nor does he verbally abuse Paul. He could have come out right there, begin either punching him, 
throwing him against the wall. He's blind after all. Crying out, you beast. You cruel and wicked persecutor. How dare you? I call down the curses of God against you. Instead, notice how Ananias responds. It's quite the opposite here, actually. Ananias instead blessed his enemy, prayed for him. He did good to him. In verse 17, the very first words out of his mouth, Brother Saul. Brother Saul. Ananias called this man, this former persecutor of the church, family. He called this man, you are one of my own. And as those, as, as one who belongs to the same family, Ananias and all the other disciples of Damascus uh, and, and Jerusalem were there, that were there with him for three days, intimately enjoying fellowship together, they are now here uh, with Jerusalem as well. Ananias' response to Paul was representative of the response of the other Christians in Damascus. Although Paul had gone to Damascus with the express purpose to arrest and imprison these very people, the disciples of Damascus show a unity in their forgiveness and reconciliation with Paul. They spent time with him, helping Paul to get his energy. They fed him. They would have prayed together. They would have worshipped together. They would have looked at scripture together. Can you imagine that scene at that moment? And that same scene occurs again once Paul reaches Jerusalem. Because in verse 26, notice all the disciples of Jerusalem are what? They are terrified of Paul. They did not want to have fellowship with Paul. They did not want to do anything with Paul. But who intervenes? Who intervenes on behalf of Paul? In Jerusalem, it's in verse 27. Barnabas. And this leads us to our third and final point. Barnabas. This Barnabas, it's the same Barnabas who in Acts 4 set aside a specific lot of land to be given to the church to aid those with the actual ministry, to those in need. This same Barnabas now intercedes and vouches for Paul. Barnabas acts on Paul's behalf so that Paul could be what? Accepted by the others. I want you to understand just how enormous it was that Paul or, or that Barnabas would vouch for Paul. Now, I can't actually think of a historical example. Uh, so I'm just going to describe a scenario to you that might come close, at least maybe the uh, emotions of it. Imagine a Nazi leader, maybe a notorious Nazi leader. Right, thinking back to World War II era. Someone who was at the head of uh, unimaginable crimes done against humanity. And let's say that during the terrors of World War II, when the Jews had to go in hiding to protect themselves throughout Europe, let's say this same Nazi leader comes upon a group of Jews hiding in a secret location, and imagine if that Nazi leader then tells that group of Jews this incredible and wild story about converting to Judaism. And that he wanted to join them in their secret, hidden location. How many of those Jews do you think would believe him? How many of you do you think would even welcome him in their midst? And not only that, but welcomed him as a fellow brother of the faith. I mean, it wouldn't just be dangerous, it would be outright insane. Which is why you have to understand, you must understand the depths and the lengths Barnabas had to go to intercede on Paul's behalf and bring about reconciliation between Paul and the other Jerusalem Christians. It wasn't just canceling a debt, but restoring broken relationships between two groups of people in mutual love. Now think about this. How many of those disciples there at Jerusalem do you think 
were related to the victims that Paul bound and dragged away. How many of those disciples had family members imprisoned for their faith by none other than the man that was standing right there before them? How many could have been related to Stephen, the first person, again, martyred for the faith, orchestrated by none other than that man standing right before their very eyes? Would you have easily accepted and welcomed someone like Paul into your midst? You have to understand it's not just the fear that he's some sort of sleeper agent or some kind of Manchurian candidate. It's his past. It's Paul's past. It's the hurt that he would have actually directed and caused against you. It's the pain. It's the anguish that he was responsible for creating. Would you easily accept someone like Paul and then align yourself with him and have fellowship with someone like that? Would you embrace such a man, someone who you knew A man that you knew brought harm to your father, to your mother, to your son, to your daughter, who were tortured and imprisoned and now with him here before your very eyes. You're called to deeply love this man and embrace him. I want you to understand what Barnabas had to go through to overcome all of this, to intercede on behalf of Paul. So that the others, for Paul to be reconciled with these others. This is what Barnabas had to deal with. He had to deal with very real sins, very real consequences, very real people with very real experiences of hurt. This would not have been easy. This would not have been simple. Nor to say that it would have even been resolved on that very day. But I want you to understand the gospel and the power of the gospel that enables us to experience this kind of transformational power. This is the radical nature of the gospel and we're seeing it unfold and demonstrated in the life of the early church. Not only with Ananias, but especially with Barnabas, truly a son of encouragement who intercedes on behalf of others to bring about reconciliation between enemies. The son of encouragement was Barnabas' name. The son of encouragement brings to life in a very real way what another son has done in our lives. When you see what Barnabas did, I want you to see the gospel and the son of God, what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ had to do. Do you understand what Jesus had to do in order for you to be accepted by God? Do you realize the depths and lengths that Jesus had to go through to intercede on your behalf and bring about reconciliation between you and God? Do you think it would have been easy for God to simply accept sinners? Do you think God, given how he is a holy God, that sin, you know what, not a big deal. That God could just simply speak it away. But for God, our God, to be light and in him there is no darkness at all. He cannot and will not do such a thing because of his holiness. Which is why God, the Son of God, voluntarily to intercede on your behalf, became just like you, human, and substituted himself voluntarily for you on the cross to reconcile you with God. In his mercy, God does not count your sins against you, 
nor does he require you to bear the penalty. Instead, what does he do? Christ. Christ becomes sin. For our sake, 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Christ bears your sin and gives you the righteousness of God. A wonderful exchange happened. Your sin was transferred to Christ and his righteousness is then transferred to you. Christ takes your place and you have taken his. And therefore God counts you as righteous just as if you were righteous on your own. A glorious blessing, one where he calls upon you and calls you sons. My children. A glorious blessing. As Christ has taken your place on the cross and gives you the righteousness of God, while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for you. And he went through extraordinary lengths to make you then his friend. See, there's another layer there. Because sometimes we think, well, he's family, but uh, he's family. Then he says, friends. Friends. This is the radical nature of the gospel of what Jesus did. And therefore, what it means to us as a church to accept and receive those who confess faith in Christ as family as brothers and sisters in the Lord, as friends. Yes, even those who may have hurt and harmed you, those who have committed perhaps even heinous and irrevocable damage to you. And yet the only reason we can even imagine or dream of reconciling is because of the irrevocable work of Christ that reconciled you with God. And there are real people in our lives, isn't there? There are real people in our lives, even today, that we just can't ever imagine reconciling with them. And yet, in likeness to our God, let us demonstrate an intentional commitment to one another in Christ-like love and accepting one another, welcoming one another in a very real and tangible way. Yes, it will be hard. It may even take a long time. It's not something that can be done overnight. But let us keep striving to see this continual bond and unity within the church that is based solely on the gospel of Christ. Let us cultivate and and see that bond and unity matured in this church. See, then, this is what we're talking about, a radical community, a community where we are reconciled with one another. That in peace, we are being built up. And that's why verse 31, we're built up with comfort in the Holy Spirit. And this is what caused the church to grow and multiply. Tangibly seeing the gospel of Christ lived out in the people of God. This is what brought so many to the faith in the early parts of the early church. Seeing the gospel of Jesus through reconciliation being lived out amongst the early Christians, that was real proof that Jesus was sent into the world as Savior. And this is why the church expanded so rapidly with people coming to faith so abundantly. And my prayer is that this church, Theophilus, would be the type of community, one where we would know that Jesus truly was sent into the world to be a Savior, to be the only true Savior, and we would be a demonstration of that reality, of an astonishing reconciliation that is seen and witnessed amongst all of us here at this church. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. That once again, we're reminded of the radical nature of the gospel. How transformational the gospel truly is. That it could bring about reconciliation between us and God. And if that could be accomplished, 
if something like that could be accomplished, truly there is no person here that we cannot work towards reconciling. We pray, O oh God, that we would be a community, a church, that understands the depth and the length of what Christ has done for us, that we might go to such lengths and such depths for one another, that we would work towards cultivating that bond and unity within this church, that we would work towards uh, seeing the gospel of Jesus Christ lived out in this congregation, that no matter how diverse we may be, no matter what backgrounds we may come from, no matter what sort of history there may be between us, we ask and pray, O oh God, that the love that was seen with Christ dying on the cross, that that love would be seen uh, even in this church through a word and deed ministry. We love you, O oh Lord. We thank you for the love that Jesus first sent to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.